interesting topic because it seems like, I mean, especially when you look at some of the notation, it seems like we're we're kind of making things unnecessarily complicated. But I, I mean, that might be the name of the game for the course. You sort of look at everything as like, are we just purposely taking things that we already know and making them more difficult than they need to be? Uh, well, sometimes, but for a purpose, right? So at first glance, this kind of looks like, well, okay, we're introducing the Greek letter rho. We have theta and we're introducing the Greek letter phi, uh, but it is for a meaningful purpose. And that purpose is when you're, when you're plotting points or functions that are linear in nature, and some some curved functions are in essence linear, you know, like for example, a polynomial function. You don't tend to think of them as linear at first glance. You're like, well, how could you say that they're linear? They're they're clearly curved. But when you follow that up with the idea that, well, they're the product of linear functions. That's all that those curved, the curve of linear functions are. They're they're the product of linear functions. So their basis is a linear system. Right. But then you have other types of functions, you know, the conic sections that, that fall into the realm of polar functions. Right. But then you also have when you when you graduate to 3D, you know, increase the dimensions. Now you have things that are spherical in nature. And and you might look at it and say, well, OK, so a sphere. Now, yeah, but an ellipsoid also. Right. Because that's spherical. It's just oblate. You know, it's it's flattened in one area and it's stretched in another, right? So we're looking at, and, and you know, there was a reason why, you know, they described the earth as an oblate spheroid. You know, you think about it, you know, like way back in the day, it's like, oh, the earth is a ball, the earth is a sphere. And then some elementary school teacher or middle school teacher corrected you and say, nope, actually it's an oblate spheroid. And you're like, okay, cool. Uh, I'll just add that to the list of words I need to know, terms I need to know. And, and you know, they weren't wrong. They just never explained what any of those words meant. You know, it's just, or maybe they did, but it might have gone over your head at the time. So the oblate spheroid is talking about something that's spherical in nature, and the oblate aspect of it is it's talking about something that's, that's flattened in, in one capacity as opposed to another. Right. So that's really all we're getting at there. But it's a spheroid. An ellipsoid is a special type of spheroid. Right. So anything that has those attributes can be represented in spherical coordinates. And, you know, like without going too far ahead of myself, I can tell you that if you work in the appropriate coordinate system, depending on the, the equation, you make your life easier, All right? So something that's cylindrical, circular in, in some capacity is best served to be in cylindrical coordinates, something that's rectangular, like linear functions, or anything that has a basis that are that's a linear function is best served to be in rectangular coordinates. And something that's spherical in nature, whether it's oblate spheroids or uh, ellipsoids or hyperboloids, paraboloids, whatever, those are best served to be in um, spherical coordinates. All right. So we got to learn how to get from one system to another. So we already know how to get from rectangular to polar and by extension uh, cylindrical. Now we just have to go from cylindrical to uh, spherical, and we also got to go from rectangular to spherical. So you have all these different ways that you can go from one system to another. Now the idea is that eh, maybe we don't want to have to stop, you know, like use cylindrical coordinates as a way station to get from rectangular to cylindrical. Sometimes you just want to go from one to the other. All right. So we're looking at this diagram. Well, you know what? Let me get my Desmos open just so I can zoom a little bit better. It's, I, I have, there's one aspect I haven't figured out is that for some reason, I lose the zooming ability, like on Zoom, Zoom on Zoom. I lose that when I don't have Desmos open. I can zoom it all I want on my screen, which is great, but I can't, uh, I can't emphasize things. It's, it's very strange. So rho is the distance between p and the origin, right? Um, so point p in space. So that we're, we're thinking of that as a radius, all right? So rho is going to take on the role of the radius, sphere, radius of the sphere, spherical radius. 
which starts with its SP. Theta is the same angle used to describe the location in cylindrical coordinates. All right, so in case you forgot, looking at theta. Now, in this diagram, it might be a little iffy. You know, it's a little weird because it's it's a perspective diagram. But if we are thinking in the x, y plane, it's a little easier to kind of visualize. But what we would be looking at in an x, y plane is a point starting at zero degrees and then traveling around that XY plane until it arrives at 360 degrees. All right, so this is in the XY plane. It's just by a perspective drawing, it's really, really hard to kind of get that across. Um, yeah, I was gonna try it, but it's, it's not gonna end well. We already know that. All right, but that's in the XY plane. All right, so that's the unit circle, essentially. The Greek letter phi is the angle formed by the positive z-axis in the line segment OP, where O is the origin, blah, 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 blah. It's the angle formed between the z-axis. So here's my z-axis. And here is my rho. Oh, that's weird. It's kind of blended right in. Oh, there it comes. So that angle rho is the angular movement from the z-axis to that, that line segment connecting the origin and the point in space, right? So those are three characteristics that make up a spherical coordinate, right? So you got the distance from the origin, so the radius, and you have those two angular measures, the angle, angle along the floor, and then the angle from the vertical. All right, come up with those values and you have your spherical coordinates, all right? <clears throat> now, in terms of coming up with those values, you know, everything's easier said than done, as it turns out. Uh, you have x equals the uh, the rho multiplied by sine of phi times cosine of theta, all right? That's our x value. The y value is rho sine of phi times the sine of theta, and z is equal to rho cosine of phi, all right? Uh, a little easier to comprehend, I would say, is that rho is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared, because essentially a distance from the origin, you know, if I go back to the distance formula, uh, let me just zoom in. This is going to be easier for me. It's the change in x squared. I'm just going to write it kind of shorthand here. Change in x squared plus change in y squared plus change in z squared. All right. And so we're talking about the change from a point in space away from zero, zero, zero. All right. So that's just going to be whatever the x, y, and z values are. So our distance in this case from the origin would be equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Well, that didn't end up being a radical. All right, all we're saying here is that we're going to let the distance from the origin forevermore be known as rho. All right, so that gets the new name rho. I tend to draw like that because I can't, I can't make it look like the typeset. All right, square both sides and you have your rho squared. All right, but you also get this little extension. You know, it's kind of like uh, r squared equals x squared plus y squared. Same concept. It's the distance. Pythagorean relationship. Probably you're going to need to know rho at some point anyway. So having this square root expression is probably not the worst idea in the world. Right? Um, <clears throat> we also have tangent of theta is equal to y over x. 
all that all that stuff is still true from the polar coordinate system. So everything that was in play before is still in play. It's just kind of weird how it all just kind of works together. All right. So for example, you can kind of look at the um, substitute, well, not, not even really an example, just kind of like a little hand-waving explanation. If you were to take some of the rules associated with the polar coordinates and combine them with spherical coordinates, you get an easier uh, conversion back and forth from one form to the other, All right? So a big question that might kind of emerge from all this is how on earth would you be able to make you know, these relationships based off of this diagram. Well, a couple of ways that you can do it. You know, it's kind of kind of simple, and it, really, when you think about it. Um, not simple in necessarily carrying out the process, but simple in the act of, you know, just where do I get started? You know, so for example, I know, and let me just... Uh, Clean up my diagram here a little bit. Get rid of that arrow. Oh, I didn't want to get rid of it. Whatever, it's going to be fine. I'm going to draw a right triangle here. All right. We know that this point in space here. X, Y, Z is going to have some height equal to Z. Right? So it's Z distance along the, the Z axis. All right. The row we just defined as basically the distance formula. That's the same as the square root of X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared uh, plus, plus Z squared. So if I'm looking from the perspective of this angle here, you know, I got an adjacent side, I got a hypotenuse. I'm gonna pull away from that and say, all right, I can take my cosine of theta. So I'll get a little thicker font here. I don't know if font's the right word when you're handwriting. Cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent Z over the hypotenuse. Or quality radical. Jesus, it's Christmas. It's just not working. I got a handwriting. It's going to look hideous. Huh? Not as bad as I thought. Poor quality Z. I got to fix that. I'm just going to leave it like that. All right. So you have that relationship, which is all well and good. But you kind of look at it and say, well, wait a minute. What if I need to fit? Oh, sorry, I put theta, just habit. Bad habit. Well, good habit if you're in an ordinary trig class, but bad habit if you're trying to get away from all that. All right, so cosine of phi. Okay. So if I want to find the value of phi, let me just do that in the, in the blue here. All I'd have to do is find the inverse cosine of both sides. All right, so that's where one of our formulas come from, comes from. So the idea that the phi, which is really the only unique part of this, because right, everything else is kind of related to stuff that we're familiar with, rows the distance from center, the tangent of theta, you know, you can, you can do the triangle thing there also. You know, you kind of look at it like, all right, I mean, you got, I mean, it's not going to look like much of a right triangle, but I can draw it out. But this is kind of an old hat. This is from the, uh, the the first unit. Not to say that everybody's going to have instant recall on it. Uh, that one I have to draw by hand if it's going to be anywhere near a perspective drawing. Oof, ugly. All right, so I'd have my theta here. This time it really is a theta. My adjacent side is x. My opposite side is y. And my hypotenuse is equal to R, which is probably something that you wouldn't necessarily know, right? I mean, you'd have to figure it out. I mean, but you have all those relationships that came into play 
back in the first unit. All right, so all that stuff is still true. I'll just kind of chuck this off on the side here. Uh, I don't really want to do that right here. There we go. We could say the sine of theta is equal to y over, well, so opposite over hypotenuse, so y over that radical. We could say the cosine of theta. I mean, it's really y over r, as we're familiar with, but since we know that r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, we can say y over the square root of x squared plus y squared, x over the square root of x squared plus y squared. If everything's in terms of x's and y's, though, tangent seems to be the most simplified form, tangent opposite over adjacent, y over x. So then if you wanted to solve for the value of theta, all you'd have to do is find the inverse tangent of both sides, right? So that's pretty not bad also. So inverse tangent, so theta is equal to the inverse tangent of y over x, 95. All right. <clears throat> but that's where that's where we get our rules from. Now, converting back and forth from one form to another is always going to be the challenge. All right. If you're going from, you know, if, if you have cylindrical coordinates, we would want to have nice little shortcuts to get us from one form to another. Manipulating this algebraically gets us a different set of form formulas. R is equal to rho sine phi, theta is, theta is itself, and then it's still the movement along the um, the floor, right, the xy plane, and z is equal to rho cosine uh, phi. And then by extension, you know, you can clean it up, different forms, rho is equal to the square root of r squared plus e squared, the theta is equal to theta, and then uh, phi is equal to the r cosine of z over the square root of r plus z squared. And that's only because r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? So um, just swapping out an x squared plus y squared for an r squared is fine, right? What I just did here is I put every variation of these formulas down because it, it's kind of like when you were working with uh, trig identity proofs back in pre-calc and algebra, classes, you know, algebra two, college algebra trade, whatever. Uh, if you just needed access to rules. If you had all the rules, odds are you could pick, find the one that that fit, you know, what did you need what you needed it to. All right. But the one I highlighted here is incredibly important because it seems to come up, or the, the set that I highlighted here are incredibly important because they seem to come up over and over again. All right. All right. So I said all right twice. R is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared, which we know. R is equal also equal to rho sine of phi, which means by extension, I'm going to emphasize that. I've already highlighted it, so it's emphasized in one way, but I'm going to emphasize the emphasis that rho sine of phi is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. So that gets us to a relationship that we know is going to allow us to convert back and forth between polar I'm sorry, spherical and um, rectangular form. Okay. So, I mean, that, that was a fairly lengthy intro to the concept, but it, in my mind, it kind of has to be because I'll tell you, I've, I've glossed over it. I'd be like, yeah, just memorize these rules. You'll be fine. It, it, it didn't work. Right? It, it didn't end well. Right? So, um, so I figured I'd take the time now to really hit the relationship between these uh, these formulas as much as I can, as much as time would allow, and uh, and hopefully that'll that'll help. Because uh, I know at the end of the semester, sometimes the brains are mush, you know. And when that happens, it's like, ah, oh, how much more stuff can we fit in here, you know? And it's like I, we we're just trying to figure out the uh, the volume stuff from last class. Now you're throwing this stuff at us. It'll all tie together, but the more you can kind of have a little basis of understanding the easier, to, the easier it'll get, All right? So the example here, plot the point with the spherical coordinates, eight, pi over three, pi over six, and express its location in both rectangular 
Oh, that's weird. You know what I did? I must have. I, I did it. I know I did it. I plotted. I, I, I must have updated the file. My, my brain is mush. Maybe that's the issue. Yeah, so that's a typo. Because the point is already plotted for you. So we want to just express the location in both rectangular and cylindrical coordinates. All right. So we have it in spherical coordinates. So we'll say given, there it is. Just making sure. Yep. So given, oh, that's weird. The point with spherical coordinates, blah, 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 express its location in both rectangular and cylindrical coordinates. All right. So what I did was I pasted, copied, pasted the rules, the important rules onto this page because I figured, you know, have it as a reference just as you go. Makes life a lot easier. <clears throat> so we have row. If I get my pen on. Row, theta theta and phi. I always struggle with the phi. I want to go the other way for some reason. So rectangular, well, x is equal to rho co, uh, sine phi cosine theta. So 8 sine pi over six, cosine pi over three. So if you know your unit circle rules here, sine pi over six is one half, pi over three, right, uh, one half, pi over three, also one half. So half of eight, half again, so result two. All right, so, so <clears throat> the y value, rho sine phi sine theta, so 8 sine pi over 6, sine pi over three. That's what I was thinking of before. Eight times a half times root three over two. Half of eight is four, half of four is two times the radical three is gonna be two radical three. So we got that, not too bad. Now, Last up is the Z, which is the easiest computation out of the three. So rho cosine phi. Or quality phi. So eight cosine pi over six. So eight times root three over two. And that's going to be four radical three. All right, so my rectangular form, let me create some space here. My rectangular form is going to be two, two radical three, and four radical three. All right. So now I just need to get it in cylindrical coordinates. The Z is gonna be the same between uh, rectangular and cylindrical. I didn't even mean to move that up. So move that over. I'll just put that there is what I meant to say. So R I cannot make an equal sign to save my life here. 
So r is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared. So the square root of two squared plus two radical three squared. So four plus four times three is 12. Rad 16 is gonna give me a four. All right, so I got that. The most convenient form of theta for cylindrical would be the inverse tangent of y over x. So inverse tangent of two radical three over two. All right, so inverse tangent of radical three. That's gonna either be I have 60 degrees, but we're in radian form, so pi over 3. Or it's going to be in, and it, by the way, I'll fess up to this in a second. Um, or it would be in the fourth, uh, I'm sorry, third quadrant at 4 pi over 3. But since theta is the same, this is me fessing up, theta is the same when you're in cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates, or cylindrical coordinates, there's, there's really no decision here. It's got to be the pi over three, right? Because it's got to be the same value, right? So it ends up being an unnecessary step. In fact, the only step that ends up being necessary here would be the first step where you compute the R value, right? That's really the only thing you need. So my cylindrical coordinates. I'll say cylindrical form would be four pi over three, and then the z value four radical three. All right. <clears throat> so that would be four steps in the direction of pi over three on the unit circle or on a polar coordinate system. And then you would be taking four radical three steps upward and that would map you to the same location, All right? Now, you could kind of look at this and say, well, I don't care what you say, pal. No matter what form these coordinates are in, it's a whole lot, well, I was gonna say a whole lot easier, but it's not, it's, 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 all, it's more of the same. It's like eight pi over three, pi over six. How is that any easier than two, two radical three, four radical three? And you know, it's really not about the coordinates, it's about the, the functions themselves. And so when you're dealing with, for example, a, a, an ellipse, you know, in two dimensions, the benefit of going over into polar form or spherical coordinates if you get into three dimensions is that you can take something that has to be expressed as a piecewise model and, and get it so that it's the function of a single variable. That, that's really what our goal is here, right? Because when we, when we think about differentiation and integration, the thing that makes it all convenient is when it's a function of a single variable. When it's a, when it's a multivariable function, it makes things more complicated. Now, sometimes we don't, have, we don't have a choice. Sometimes you have to work with multivariable functions, but if you compare it down to as few variables as possible, then you're making everybody's life easy, right? So in number two, where it says, describe the surfaces defined by the following equations. You look at rho equals 13. That's pretty easy if you know where to look. You know, rho is equal to 13. That means that rho squared is equal to 169. And since rho squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared, that's our equation of a sphere with a radius of 13, all right? So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm proving anything to you here, but I think you're probably gonna agree that it's gonna be easier to work with the rho equals 13, it's a constant function, as uh, than it would be to work with, and I'll just show you real quick. If I solve this for z, and we did this before, 
it would be plus or minus the square root of 169 minus x squared minus y squared. That might look familiar because what we did in the past, and the past being a relative term, is we converted that into cylindrical form to make it easier to manage. Or actually, that, that was weirdly phrased, to make it more manageable, all right? Regardless, rectangular form is not the way to go, but to recognize the function for what it is, it makes it a little bit easier uh, to, to convert it at least a one time, all right? For B, you got theta is equal to two pi over three. Well, we got a different, a couple of different ways that we can go from here. Now you can kind of go the way we went with uh, when we were thinking about planes, you know, back in, and you know, kind of stealing my own thunder here, but back in uh, the second unit when we we're talking about planes, we were saying, well, uh, if it's if it's one variable equal to a constant it means that it's for all of the other variables. So this is theta equal to two pi over three, but intuitively we're saying for all B and Z. Um, row, sorry. I forgot which system I was in there for a second. That's always been my challenge. You know, everybody's gonna face different challenges when it comes to this stuff, but I think unless I'm projecting my own inadequacies onto everybody else, I'm thinking that the only thing that people struggle with when it comes to the coordinate systems is just keeping track of which system you're in. You see the numbers and you think cylindrical when you're in spherical, for example. Yeah. So this is saying for all values of rho, for all values of, well, phi first and rho in this case, the way I wrote it. Yeah. But one thing I could do is I could take the tangent of both sides, say tangent of theta, is equal to two uh, tangent of two pi over three. All right, tangent two pi over three is equal to negative radical three. All right, we also know that tangent is equal to y over x. So y is equal to negative radical three times x. The reason I like to talk about this kind of problem is just so you can get an idea that we're taking, we're essentially taking functions, uh, variable functions, whether they're multivariable or not. The first one was multivariable. The second one is not. It's a single variable function. We're taking them and making them constant functions by converting them into, into spherical coordinates. All right, that's the power of the spherical system. All right, and then you have C. I keep doing that. I don't know why? We have uh, phi is equal to pi over four. All right, a couple of different ways we can go from here, but the the most likely way is different. Well, we got a relationship that involves phi being equal to something, and that is z over. You know, it's the adjacent over hypotenuse, the z over the distance from center. Uh, and it's also the arc cosine. I'll get that in there. And that's going to be equal to pi over 4. So here you kind of go the other way, where the relation, let me just move this. Yeah. Honestly, I guess, let me just, let me show the intermediate step. It's really not necessary because we derived it on the previous page, but just, just so you have it. What I would do is I'd say, okay, well, I could take the cosine of both sides here. Okay, and we can get that we can get that value out of it, but then we have cosine of phi is equal to the 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 uh, pi over four. I don't know what it's like right in front of me, and I couldn't even say it. 
right? So from there, we can say, let me just move this out of the way for a second. We can say that the cosine of phi, you know, adjacent over hypotenuse is just the Z over all that stuff. And that's equal to radical two over two. Yeah. I think that might be the better, I don't know. I, I go back and forth on this. You can go either way because the, the second way, or I'm sorry, the first way, which will now become the second way, was really just derived on work that we had already completed. What I just did is kind of kind of taking it from the ground up. I don't know, there's pros and cons either way, I guess. Let me just reduce this a little bit. Uh, let me reduce it. Just kind of moving some things over. So I'll just throw a quick or in here. Either way, the next step in the process would be this one because I would take the cosine of both sides and we would get to this step. All right. From there, it's just algebra. And that's where that technology assignment pays off because once you perform the algebra, it starts to make a little bit more sense. But one skill that you might want to apply here is squaring both sides to get rid of those radicals. All right. So Z equals, uh, sorry, Z squared. Right? X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equal to one half. That's because the square root of two squared is two. Two squared is four. Two fourths is equal to one half. All right. And you can cross multiply, you know, all, all that good stuff. So two Z squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. And then you clean it up bring everything over to the same side, any loose constants go alone because that's typically what happens when you're dealing with, uh, whether it's an ellipsoid or a paraboloid or whatever, based off of that, um, that tech assignment, if it's any kind of quadric function or quadric equation, so basically a three-dimensional version of a quadratic, uh, then, then you wanna get everything over to the same side except for the constants. So we're looking at X squared, plus y squared minus z squared is equal to zero. And then whether you graph it or not, you'd be looking at a hyperboloid of one sheet. All right. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about like hyperboloid of one sheet, hyperboloid of two sheets. If, if you recognize what a hyperbola looks like, right? So those opposing graphs you know, from pre-calc, yeah, the two para basically two parabolas that face in opposite directions. Sometimes they were vertically oriented, sometimes horizontally, sometimes obliquely. A hyperboloid of one sheet is a three-dimensional version of that where they're connected. The hyperboloid of two sheets is where it's a three-dimensional three version of that where they're disconnected. That's all it is. All right, you pick that right up off, off of uh, GeoGebra pretty easily, I think. All right, so that's, I mean, definitely a short version of the uh, spherical coordinates, the spherical coordinate system. Uh, I I gotta say that this is this is kind of if you really look at the material that we've just covered. This is really kind of best suited for a pre-calc class, if you really think about it. Like, where's the calculus? You know, we didn't really do anything. We're applying lots and lots of pre-calc knowledge. I just dropped my glasses. But the reality is, what's the likelihood that people, I mean, I mean there's always people that are going to prove me wrong, but what are the chances that an entire class of students, you're going to remember all this stuff going from pre-calc through calc one, through calc two, assuming that it's all sequential, getting all the way through to uh, getting to this point in calc three without forgetting all this stuff. 
And so it kind of was decided a long time ago that this material would be re uh, well just introduced in this course rather than introduced in pre-calc and then having you know having to teach it all over again anyway all right but this is really pre-calc kind of stuff same thing with the uh, the polar coordinates so if you're finding this to be easy or difficult i think it's directly related to the the skills that you have in pre-calc okay and i can tell you it, uh, throughout the course, you probably recognize the same thing in Calc 2. Maybe not so much in Calc 1, because a lot of people find Calc 1 to be easier than Calc 2, because uh, I'm sorry, than, uh, than pre-calc, because they kind of get away from a lot of the pre-calc concepts, at least until the very end. I can say that I started getting really, really good at calculus, you know, like the, the more advanced stuff after I taught pre-calc for a solid decade, you know, and it's kind of like, well, you're supposed to get really good at it right now without any, without that benefit, you know, it's not a good position to be in, but we also don't have the same kind of standards, I guess. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things, you know, like you, you might find down the line, it all clicks, you know, right now it's like just more information, more information. But then down the line, it's like, oh, that's why, you know, hopefully it doesn't take teaching pre-calc for 10 years in order for you to understand all this stuff. All right. So uh, evaluate the, tri the iterated triple integral, kind of redundant. Iterated integral, triple integral, it's the same thing, you know. The triple is just indicating how many iterations there are. Uh, this one looks like a pretty heavy duty problem. It's actually easier than a lot of the stuff we've been doing because the integral is already set up for you. And all it is is partial integration. I'm going to work inside out. I'm looking at this and saying, okay, I'm integrating with respect to rho. It's the same idea as integrating with respect to r, with respect to theta, with respect to q, with respect to whatever you want. All right. So one third rho cubed sine of b. Four quality fee. Now, who am I kidding? They're all four quality fees. Over the interval of zero to one. This first time through, I made it a point to put the variable rho equals this, b equals that, just so you kind of see that that's what the relationship is. But you won't have it. You could just write zero to one, zero to uh, uh, pi over two, and so on. All right. Making your substitution gives you a, a pretty clean result here. I mean, as clean as you can expect. You know, you plug in a one, you're gonna get a, a well, geez, it's, it's beautiful. You're gonna get a one third sine of phi. Yeah, you plug in a zero, it's gonna zero out. Yeah, right? because you're plugging in for rho. So not, not too bad at all. all right, so then we're going the next level. So, and I'll, I'll still include the notation here. Oh, so ugly. Now this one, if you look at all the bounds and the variable of integration and then the variable contained within the integrand, you see that it's all consistent which means that this could go right in the calculator if you wanted to. Although numbers aren't that bad, so I'm gonna do it by hand, right? So antiderivative sine, negative cosine, so one third with a negative in front of it, cosine of phi over the interval of zero to pi over two. All right, plug in a zero for cosine, you get, I'm oh, sorry, plug in a, a pi over two for cosine, you get a zero. So we're going to get zero minus negative. Then you plug in a zero for cosine, so we have one third times one. Probably a lot more parentheses than I need, but whatever. Result one third. 
Then the last part is just integrating that over the interval zero to pi. All right, so. So we're looking at theta equals zero, theta equals two pi, one third d theta. So theta over three is my integral going from zero to two pi. So the result would be two pi over three. All right, and that is uh, super easy, barely an inconvenient. All right, not too bad at all. all right, the key, the key, of course, is going to be determining the the integral, the the integrand to begin with. All right, but we're looking at rho squared sine of phi. You kind of look at that; it's kind of similar. If you look at the rules that we have on the side there, we have a rho sine of phi. If I wanted to do a conversion here, this would actually be the product of the square root of x squared plus y squared and the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That's one variation of it. Another way of writing it, uh, excuse me, would be the, uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared times sine of phi, and then you'd have to convert the sine of phi over. Either way, you're getting a monstrous radical, right? Not something overly simple, right? So the benefit here is that you took it without realizing it, possibly, you took something that was more complicated and made it into something that was actually fairly simple, right? So let's go on to the next page. Let's see, uh, let's say, see if we can figure out how to how to make these expressions on our own. Right, when we're given rectangular forms. So we want a triple integral over bounded volume using spherical coordinates. All right, so, and I lifted this diagram. I think I might've got it from the OpenStax textbook. I forget, I, it, it looks like, it looks very OpenStaxy. If not, I, I snagged it from somewhere. Right, uh, I probably should cite the source. I'm gonna really give that student the business over Plagiarism, I should probably do the right thing myself. Um, I'll take that as a typo. Cite the source on the diagrams or diagram on page 87. Right. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I mean, I'm already a hypocrite. I just don't want to officially be one. Thank you. So <clears throat> we have this idea that we have a function of x, y, z, ah, a typo that was never fixed. Crazy. Look at that. That's not a z. Somebody claim that typo, please. All right, so that should be x, y, z. So that's corresponding with all the all the substitutions related to x, y, and z. All right. So we're looking at x and the rule for x, y and the rule for y, z and the rule for z. All right. So what do we do here? You know, the, the idea is that if we could somehow come up with a relationship that allows us to easily, I would say, convert the integral, because we, we already have a way of converting the function into spherical coordinates. If we can convert the, it used to be a unit cube, now it's a unit sphere. If we can convert that volume into spherical coordinates, then, then we'll have what we need, all right? So this is related to a unit cube. I 
that looks cool, but I really need the figure there. That needs to convert over to being a unit sphere or a unisphere. I keep wanting to just get rid of the P in the word sphere. I don't know why. All right. So that, that's the big connection that needs to occur there. Okay. And it turns out that happens based off of this relationship. And I'll, I'll walk you through that in a sec. All right. So Oh, you know what? <laughs> I thought I already did that. I guess I'll walk you through that in a few seconds because um, I thought I <laughs> thought I actually taught you that already. Oh yeah, yeah. What a what a schlemiel I am. What can you do? Okay, well, just sit tight on that explanation. It's coming, but we're we'll get there. Um, hello. Maybe I'll just steal my own thunder. Yeah, okay. Well, the example two is essentially what I'm about to do here. So I'll, I'll probably just copy paste it down there anyway. But what we'd be looking to do here is because we're calling this a unit sphere, I did it again. I don't know. It's like the snowball effect. I just can't stop now. Unit sphere volume. Okay. So if I want to determine that volume <clears throat> and do it a couple of different ways, but the one obvious way, I think, would be to find the triple integral of just some constant value that I'll call one, because right? I don't want it to be scaled up in any capacity. So again, it's going, uh, we're first dealing with the row value, right? So in a unit sphere, the radius is going to be one, right? So it'll go from zero to one. In terms of, this is where things get a little interesting. I'll, I'll actually attempt, it's not going to be pretty, I'm just terrible at the diagrams, but it uh, hopefully it'll get the idea across. So oh, that almost worked. I'm going to draw it kind of front and center and then I'll move it out of the way in a minute. So we know that it's going out one unit. So I'm gonna draw it going out one unit. I'll call that one unit. Now, the value for rho has to be the distance from, well, I use the word distance loosely, right? So it's an angular movement from the Z axis, right? So that's my, I think I said rho, I meant to say phi. The rho is the distance equivalent to one because it's a unit sphere. But the phi should be the distance in an angular sense from the z-axis, all right? Now, if I'm gonna create a sphere, all right? And what I'll do is I, I will steal part of my diagram here. Oh, you know what? I don't even know if that's gonna work. I'm just gonna draw it. In order to get 
the appropriate figure, what I would have to do is, is well, it's a couple of things. I'd have to first account for any kind of movement away from that z-axis. Okay. Now I just pick pick the moment in time here, time and space. But any of these points along the way would would suffice. All right. So I have my z-axis down here extending in the negative direction. It's negative z. So any of the points along this path going from the negative z-axis to the positive z-axis could technically be points along this, the edge or the circumference, the surface of the sphere. All right, you get the idea. Maybe draw a couple more. Nah, I can't draw a couple more, but you get the idea. All right, so working your way downwards. Now, if you take that kind of half moon figure and spin it around the z-axis, what you're gonna end up doing is covering a total of 360 degrees. But that's gonna be kind of a, 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 if you're thinking in terms of latitudes and longitudes, where we're gonna think in terms of the equator, all right? So, you know, the, the biggest latitude there is. So we're gonna take the equator and use that to represent conceptually the value of theta, all right? So if I just focus on the one half here, just the one side, and then take each of these points and just kind of ring them around the rosy here, They become latitudes. With the biggest one out of all of them, the equator, being the one that we use to measure like the old AT&T symbol. Well, if it didn't look like crap on the left-hand side, it would, you know. Probably should have left the circle the way it was. You know what I'm going to do? Diagram's falling apart. I'm going to bring the circle back, not with the shading. And just try. And so all of these are getting spun around like a volume of revolution. That's essentially the basis of what we're doing. All right, so every one of those is going around and then making the return trip once it goes around the planet, basically. They're supposed to be little arrowheads. All right, but if we take that hemisphere, right, if we take that hemisphere and spin it around. So I'm taking this guy here and spinning it around, then what we'll get is the entire sphere. All right, so then the big question would be okay, well, what are the measures of that? Well, phi is designated as zero at the North Pole, right? So B, so I'm using, you know, obviously Earth-based terms here, right? So this is V equals zero. And down here at the negative Z, we're looking at V equals, well, it's a half turn. So V equals pi, 180 degrees. So that's my next set of bounds. So zero to pi. And then if I'm making one full turn, if I'm taking that circular value and spinning it around the whole way, then I'm gonna end up with zero to two pi for my theta. Now, 
and then integrating this to get us where we need to go. All right, takes uh, a lot of doing to draw a diagram. There's plenty of stuff available on, oh, why did I copy that? I just wanted to resize it and move it. Available online to, to visualize this stuff. And I'll send out some resources later. I used to have them on my website. I just, honestly, I can't remember if I still have them there. So I don't want to, I don't want to claim anything is there when I don't, when I'm not 100% sure, but they, um, they, they're, there's some really good ones out there. And if I can, well, I know I can find them. If I can easily find them, I'll send them out right now, but I don't think I'll be. Anyway, so we're going to integrate. And the good thing, one of the good things about spherical coordinates, once you get it in the right form, you know, you just think about what we did. I mean, this compared to what we did on the previous page, it's almost the same problem, right? So you'll you'll see that that tends to be the case very, very frequently, right? So we're looking at one third P cubed sine of phi over the interval of zero to one, which we already know is one third sine of phi. You know, it won't, ex it won't always be exact, exactly the same, but it'll be the same level of difficulty. You know, that's the whole point of getting it in this form. Okay. So zero to pi of one third sine of phi e phi. I'm just gonna go right to the calculator on this now. I just want to make use of my resources. And I think in most cases, you guys, you folks do too. I would hope anyway. Here's your axes. Two thirds. And so zero to two pi two-thirds d theta, that one, you know, you get to the finish line, that one you can totally do by hand. All right, so two pi, uh, two theta over three is four pi over three. All right. Now, you look at this and you say, okay, well, that's cool, we got a number. Congratulations, I suppose, are in order. You did great, kid. I don't know. If, if if you haven't made the connection yet, I, I can I can get you the rest of the way. Volume of a sphere. Four thirds pi times the radius cubed. If it's a unit sphere, radius is equal to one. So volume of a unit sphere, I did it again, four thirds pi times one cubed is equal to four thirds pi, or four, four pi over three if you want. So why bother doing this triple integration in order to come up with an answer that we know very well based off of ordinary geometry rules. Well, the excitement of proving a rule exists based off of advanced calculus. No, um, not, not really anything to do with that. It has to do with the fact that we needed to demonstrate that what we were dealing with was the symbolic form or the function form or the spherical coordinates form that represented the volume and in this case, the instantaneous change in volume, specifically of a unit sphere, right? So now that we have that, we now have the ability to make a substitution, right? So whenever we need to convert into spherical coordinates from rectangular coordinates, the dx, dy, dz can now be replaced with a row squared, oh, you know what? 
another typo that for some reason never ever got fixed typos galore somehow some way this became a p it's supposed to be a row that's shocking all right so i'll be i'll be fixing typos all night tonight thank you so sign a fee the row the fee the theta all right, that's your substitution when you're dealing with rectangular to spherical coordinates. All right, makes life a lot easier when you have that relationship to fall back on. 